How's it going guys? Now first of all, thank you so much to everyone that watched the video that we released last week where we were recording some classic rock guitar tones on some vintage amps in the studio featuring uh, Bruce John Dickinson. It was, uh, it was really fun to film and I'm glad so many of you enjoyed it. Now what we said in that video is that you could use something like GarageBand or other amp modeling or even you know, mic up amps at home to get something like similar results or to at least sort of coach yourself and train yourself and learn what kind of tones we can get when we're recording or just learn more about tones in general. I think there's perhaps a misconception that uh, it's all about EQ settings and, and things like that and sometimes the recording process itself colours the sound so much more than you might think and mic placement and everything like this that we can perhaps you know, EQ things in post is so, so important. So to demonstrate this and to make this as applicable to as many people as possible, I'm gonna be recording my Epiphone guitar, has got a Seymour Duncan pickup at the bridge, an SH1. I'm recording this guitar with GarageBand and showing you what we can do with the mic placement and the amplifier settings that are using amp modeling in there. And perhaps what you can do to simulate uh, similar results in any amp modeling software um, and comparing the differences between budget amp modeling software to higher level budgeting software. So let's open up GarageBand and let's take a look at how we can uh, get some rock guitar tones in there. So we're going to be recording some guitars on my computer and hearing how it sounds. We could be doing this on iPad or on iPhone. Um, or you could be doing it on any mobile or tablet device using other plugins and software. I will make some recommendations in the description below. But there is always going to be limitations to what you can do and what you can um, amend and change, what settings are available on tablets and mobile. So we're going to be going onto the desktop to give you the full whammy. This is a project I've created which has uh, the real Cornell amp that we recorded in Small Pond Studios. Let's have a listen to that first amp, first of all. And we also have some drums which come included with the Garage Gan Band package, but I've upgraded to the Retro Rock um, drum kit for this particular sound. Snare. And you can set that up very quickly, very easily. It is very plug and play. In fact, I would say that GarageBand is the most plug and play software which you can get great guitar sounds on, but also record full songs. And it has its own mastering software and things like that, all included. Um, and these are things that, you know, the drum samples, the guitar samples, um, compression, limiters, all these things, when I've used PC recording uh, software or, or anything, um, they're always extra. They're always plugins that you have to buy separate. The stuff that's included here is really superb. When you get used to it, it can be a real gateway to perhaps using Logic or Pro Tools or getting to a higher level. But as plug and play software, it is really fantastic, as I say, even on the iPad. And the guitar plugins do come with a lot of presets. So we have a British Invasion kind of sound, you know, 80s goth, everything like that. Um, a couple of my favourites are definitely the Heartbroken, which is essentially a simulation of the sound we're going for. So we're going to start with that one. Honk and Drive, a Keith Richards kind of thing. An indie sound, punk, everything that you would need. Um, a lot of ranges and, and it does, you know, give an impression of what the amp looks like um, as well. So this is a fantastic learning tool. Let's see how this sounds first of all. So this... That is my Epiphone Les Paul, recorded straight into GarageBand, just with this software that, that is included, just as essentially using an audio plugin. Um, so no actual amplifier there, it's all done in the plugin. That is an absolute preset. I haven't changed one thing from what is called the Heartbreaker setting. Now, when you use iPad or iPhone, it's called something different, or they uh, they do have different names. So I guess the closest would be Classic Crunch, and then you could tweak the amp settings here to match what I've got on screen or tweak to your heart's content. But the extra thing that we have on the screen here, you can see, is we could change the cabinet to anything that we wanted, this is the one that comes up automatically. And we can change the microphone and the mic placement. 
So if I, hopefully this will work as well. That's sort of right in the center of the cone and as bright as it could be. Moving it to the edge. And then moving it back. And for essentially, this software comes pre-installed on Macs and you can use a, a very similar thing with so many other audio plugins that you can get for any bit of audio software. Many are free, many are cheap, you know, say a hundred pounds and things. I'll leave some examples of those in the description. But these are all very affordable and they're fantastic learning tools. Now, if we compare that more directly, we're gonna to start to hear a difference. So if we hear the Cornell again, we can start to hear a difference in tonality. You can hear their, their similar sounds, but um, the software amplifier, the garage band amplifier, is a lot thinner and a lot harsher, a lot pokier. But the Cornell sounds just sounding fatter and warmer, and all those things that we would say are the sound of analog and valve amps and all those things that we like. But of course, that was just using the first preset. So what I've done on these next two, on the uh, Plexi SM58 and the Plexi Ribbon, is I have actually tried to simulate exactly what we, what we did, like putting the microphones exactly where, where they were placed. So our amp settings when we recorded the Plexi were as follows, and I've recreated those as much as possible in the GarageBand software. The only one that I can't do exactly is the volume one, volume two kind of idea, um, because this GarageBand software does have a gain and then a master volume, which the Plexi we used doesn't have, but this is as close as we can reasonably hope to do with this essentially free software. We've got the microphone, the 57, just off of center, so that would be center. Let's go for about there. And then I've duplicated that same sound on a new channel and just changed the microphone for a ribbon microphone and placed that, as you can see, away from that speaker cone, which was around there, though I think it could be further away um, to simulate exactly what we had. So, if we just listen to the Plexi sound that I've now created, this new one with the SM58, let's have a listen to that. <laughs> It's not bad, it's not bad. Let's see if we can hear a difference with the ribbon microphone. There is more of that character coming through. It's a little bit less sharp and pokey. A little bit more fizz. And I guess if we uh, go to the SM58 one and we just repeat this, I will show you that it really is just the change of microphone there. So the 57. And some of the famous microphones, you know, condenser microphone, all on four, the 609, my favorite, really bright. Hearing those two together, compared to the Cornell, to the real amplifier, there's a different character. Screen, I'm using screen capture so my computer is suffering a little bit. It is really hot as well. You've got to say it is at least delivering that sort of plexi type tone. Now there are things that it's not delivering at all. Um, it has a different kind of flavor in, in the EQ and there is a what I would describe tonally as a ha sound. Ha sound. That sort of full mid bulk of the sound, which to my understanding isn't just um, the actual valves working and, and the real amplifier working, but it's also that movement of air, which has been, um, been, been told to me is so important in actually getting that fuller tone, um, which you just, especially for the plexi sound, is, is such a part of it. But again, essentially free software. And even if we would set up that same amplifier in the same studio, what it's hard to 
communicate to people who haven't done it yet is it's really hard to get the same sound even with the same gear same settings just on a different day perhaps in a different room it's really really tricky to simulate the exact same thing if you don't believe that then just listen to three different tracks from your favorite band or your favorite artist they might be using exactly the same guitars and setup and things but each song just has its own characteristics. Now that can be the production or things like that, but a lot of it just comes down to it's actually hard to replicate the same sound. Definitely true from getting a sound in the studio to getting the sound live at a gig. They often sound completely different. So I feel that the cabinet... I changed the cabinet as we can just have a quick look at to uh, a British vintage. That is our, our vintage Marshall cab. Um, and we've got the, the Marshall head as we've seen and, and the 57. I'm more of a fan in Garage Band, just for it to kind of record better, of using um, the Vox um, speaker amp, which again, this sort of capability of mixing and matching isn't available on, on the iPads and stuff. You have to get the computer for this sort of stuff. I'm also not a big fan, really, of the uh, 57 on GarageBand. I'd more use a condenser, the ribbon, and something else perhaps for flavor. But this we're listening to is just um, the Plexi condenser. This would be, especially when we add that with the ribbon. I think that's a lot closer to the Plexi sound. Yeah. This starts to sound really cool, like pan, just a little bit of my opinion. It sort of makes up a little bit for that lack of warmth on my speakers anyway. The other thing I've done and the thing that I didn't talk about actually earlier is we were using a treble boost stomp box on that Plexi sound on the original two on the Plexi SM58 and a Plexi ribbon. On these two, I've used a Vintage Drive, it's called. These are just the plugins that appear for me and that I um, sort of reuse when I am doing little demos and things. So just compare that, I guess. So that's a Vintage Drive. That's without any stun boxes. Marshall now has no grunt. Treble booster. So while it's not a hundred percent replicating like you know things like the Kemper um, profiling amplifiers, uh, UAD Universal Audios, you know they can be anywhere from one thousand to one and a half thousand pounds or a couple of thousand dollars, and they would claim to be able to get you a lot closer to what we recorded with the Cornell amp, and even with just free software that is included with a Mac or with other guitar products, you know, other things, other software that would claim to do this kind of thing, which is fairly affordable. The Waves plugins, Amplitude, all of those kind of things. Um, there are so many software plugins these days that do this same thing that I'm demonstrating with GarageBand. We're getting very close for not a lot of money, especially for demos, for checking your own playing, and to be able to quickly sketch out, you know, a song that you're doing, or to record yourself to listen back and, and assess your playing. It's a way that you can um, get very high quality recordings, um, quiet, because you could even use headphones, so it could even be silent practice if you have other people in the house, and with a decent pair of monitor speakers, you can really get it sounding something like 
Things to be wary of with this kind of software. Garage Band in particular is very good at making the amplifiers look um, exactly or very close to what they look like in real life. And visually, all this kind of thing of changing mic placements and moving them around and being able to have all these lovely uh, pedals all here that we can just drop in. You know, there's a big, let's drop some fuzz there. Boom, there we go. Um, you know, getting a tremolo on there. They all look very impressive on the screen and sometimes that does not correlate to them sounding good. Um, so you've got to be very careful when you're using plugins that you don't get too lulled into it just looking like it will sound like the thing but not actually sounding like the thing that you're replicating. And also remembering that it's a great learning tool but it's not necessarily the best thing to, to be using for your situation. It just depends on your situation. It's just a very easy way to get some quick results and get some recording done as and when you need. But amp simulators are always going to lack that characteristic of the amplifier, um, the warmth, the fullness, and the, the playing feedback. If you're playing through um, direct through garage band and that's all you're hearing. It's not going to react in the same way as a real amp does, especially a real kind of vintage amp turned up loud with the sorts of things that we were talking about in the recording video in the studio. So there we have it guys. I hope that was really useful to you. Let me know what more you would like to see along this similar kind of topic of either home recording, guitar tones, everything kind of like this. Um, and I will shoot them for you. I look forward to hearing your suggestions in the comments um, and hope to see you again on this Andy Guitar YouTube channel.